So, are, are we all okay to join in? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you are. Everybody else? Yeah, still you. Okay, this is going to be good. Okay, some quick questions about um, that you need to answer out loud. What color is snow? Everybody. What color is a doctor's coat? What color are clouds? What color are, is this t-shirt? What do cows drink? Aha! They, they don't drink milk, do they? They drink water. However, asking you a series of questions before, and you're all very intelligent adults, but can be nudged to say the wrong answer to something, that cows drink milk. Some people will say, inevitably will say, that baby cows drink milk, and that's true. And, um, but that wasn't the answer to the question. So, but the point is, within a few questions, your very intelligent adult minds could be nudged to say a totally different answer than the one that is true. And if that's true, imagine what else is going on inside of our brains um, when we're making decision making, when we're understanding the world, when we're purchasing something, when we're clicking on something. So over the next 55 minutes, I will teach you a little bit more about your brain, how you make decisions, how you don't think in the way that you think you think, and show you lots of examples of how that applies to the work that we all do together. So, has anybody read any of these books? Yes. Okay. And in the middle there, which the shout, which ones have you read? Uh, all, nearly all. Nearly all. That sounds like a lie. Um. <laughs> Thinking fast and slow. Okay. And nudge, yeah. Um, into the nuns union. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. You're in. You're in it. She's in it. And how about in the middle? I think that's a good one. Yeah, very good one. Yeah. So these are so in the past ten years. Um, so psychologists have worked for over 100 years to understand more about how the brain works and why we do what we do. Over the past kind of 10 to 15 years, there's been some amazing books written that really kind of condenses those dense academic papers and insights about human psychology into some really, as you'll agree, kind of easy to read, fun to read books. And, um, and what I do is based on, and what I do with the team at Ogilvy, is taking these insights about how we really think, feel, and act and, and using that to influence uh, people. This is actually a picture of my brain. You can tell it's my brain by the big nose that sticks out on the side over there. Um, you'll see that's true if you be speaking the drinks later. Um, and there's a big hole in the middle. We don't really know what that is, but apparently it's totally fine. But this is a picture of my brain when I used to be um, a, a, real, a real psychologist. Uh, the brain is about 1.4 kilograms in weight. It feels like mushroom when you touch one. And the smaller your brain is, the more intelligent you are. People often think that a bigger brain is a better brain. Actually, a smaller brain is a more efficient brain. Einstein had a very small brain, apparently. So if someone says, you've got a big brain, they're just uh, offending you. Um, and so you want a small brain. So everything that you think, everything that you see, hear, smell, the people that you love, what you think about this talk, is all happening inside of that brain by the electricity that's inside it. And that just absolutely astounds me, that all everything you feel happens in that thing there. Now, the man that founded the organization that I work for, Ogilvy, uh, David Ogilvy, had a great quote, which really showed that he was an early behavioral scientist. He said, people don't think what they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. Ultimately, we don't have what psychologists call introspective access, to the parts of the brain that are really making the decisions. We have this conscious brain that we're all aware of right now, and then we have this huge subconscious brain that is doing lots of hundreds of thousands of calculations every second to process lots of things that we're totally unaware of. And so if we want to influence someone, we often rely on asking them um, about uh, what would change their behavior. The fact is we, we, simply, we simply don't know. So actually by understanding how we really think they'll act, we can better influence them. Um, and by, we can do that by um, ultimately, rather than thinking about selling to people all the time, thinking about this through a lens of behavior change. Most of the briefs that we work on and most of the things that, that in marketing nowadays we're all asked to do is to think about deeper behavior change questions rather than just selling something to someone. Or at least if we understand about how to change their behavior, we'll be even better at selling them something. And so that's why it's so important, hopefully, to have a psychologist view um, on the industry. Now, over the last 100 years, psychologists have been busy um, decoding the brain 
and all of its biases and heuristics and mental shortcuts that it makes in that system one subconscious brain. And we've been decoding all of the different rolls of thumb that we have. So your brains have, are adapted evolutionary-wise over hundreds of thousands of years, not to live in this environment that we live today, but to live on the grasslands of Africa in a very different environment, in an environment of scarcity, which is why we've evolved to when we see kind of fats and sugars to really crave them really quickly, because in the past, we wouldn't have known when we were getting our, our next fix. But then nowadays, we have plenty of stuff all around us, and so that brain doesn't really, really fit um, anymore. So we, we've evolved to live in an environment that isn't this one, which is why it's so hard to concentrate when you've got a mobile phone in your pocket. You know, studies have shown that simply the presence of your phone in your pocket right now is distracting your brain a little bit. People are much better at solving um, intelligence tests when the phone is outside of the room versus in the room. It's simply because your brain is doing lots more than, than you are realizing at any one point. But there's all these different um, heuristics and behavioral principles that are acting at any one point, and I'm going to tell you about them and how to use them. And uh, the whole world is using behavioral science already to influence um, people. And we've worked with Google, Facebook, Unilever Coke, European Parliament, lots of different people to use behavioral science to better shape um, people's behavior. And um, if anybody uh, wants any reading recommendations, I'll give you some at the end. Um, this is the team that I'm lucky enough to run at Ogilvy with the man in the middle, Rory Sutherland, who's... Um, who's a kind of a TED legend, world leading proponent of applying behavioral science in the world of marketing. It's well worth, a, well worth a Google afterwards. So I want to give you a brief foundation in behavioral science just to kick us all off. Um, but first, I want to tell you about an experiment. So this is an experiment that we actually did uh, when we first opened. And it was essentially giving people the option of a free breakfast. And in that free breakfast, we'd give them the healthy option and an unhealthy option. So on the healthy side, we'd have bananas, oranges, apples, and on the unhealthy side, we'd have high sugar alternatives, blueberry muffins, double chocolate muffins, all that type of stuff. Given a free choice, do you think people are more likely to go for the healthy option or the unhealthy option? Unhealthy option, yes. In England, people always say the unhealthy option. It changes around the world very drastically, but typically in this country, that's how it goes. And when we did this experiment, we got about an 80-20 split. I think it was 79% of people naturally reached for the unhealthy option when given a free option for breakfast in the morning. Until we did these three things. So there's something known that the psychologists call the TK Max effect. So it's basically the idea that we don't like to rummage through things. So if you separate out the bananas from the oranges from the apples, people are actually more likely to pick them up because the brain is simulating the action before it does it. It's a slightly easier thing to do to not have to rummage in a jumbled up fruit bowl. So if you separate out the bananas from the oranges from the apples, people are more likely to stay for the healthy option. You jumble up the sugar alternatives. If you put the fruit and the healthy option in the middle of the table versus on the extremes of the outside, people are more likely to pick them up. We like middle options. We like to go for the central choices. And also, finally, we put a giant mirror behind the table because it gets you to self-reflect in the moment about all of your goals and desires for yourself, and it nudges people to go for the healthy option. Now, nobody, and when we ran that experiment with those nudges applied, you get almost a flipping of the other side. It's 25% of people now going for the unhealthy option, so a massive change. Now, nobody who's going for that breakfast is going to tell you that the reason why they now picked an orange rather than a muffin was because of the mirror, was because of the fact that the fruit wasn't jumbled up anymore, or because they were um, popped in the middle of the table. No one's going to tell you those things. Everyone's going to post rationalize and it's going to say, the reason why I picked the healthy option is because you know, I'm re I've got a lot of great self-control, um, I'm on a great um, diet right now, and I'm just generally pretty good at making good choices. That's generally the things that we tend to hear. However, we know that the reason is because of some of these environmental factors that have nudged the choice. This is a, a discipline known as choice architecture. How you design or architect the choice system affects the decisions that people take. And there's no such thing as neutral choice architecture. When you go for your drinks later or the food that you've had today, the way that it's laid out is influencing the choices that you will make. And we're often not aware of that. I think it's important um, that we know about it. I now want to take you to the supermarket. So we're all going to leave the, the five-star Sofitel Hotel in London. We're going to go to the supermarket together. And I'm going to give you an option of beer 
And I'm going to show you that there's no such thing as stable preferences. All of our preferences are aligned to the context that we're in. So what do we got? We got the very cheap, sorry if there's anyone from Tesco here, the very cheap Tesco value lager on the left, low price, low taste credentials, you could say. Uh, going up the chain, we've got Carly, slightly more expensive, slightly more tastier. Then we've got Budweiser, carrying on. And then we've got Peroni, piece of resistance at the end, most expensive, most tastiest, according to the data. If we just have Carling and Budweiser on the shelf, 33% of people go for uh, Carling and 67% of people go for Budweiser. If we do nothing, we don't change the price, we don't change the positioning, we don't change the advertising, we simply add Tesco Valley Lager on the end, more people now are going to go for that central option. So more people are now going for, for Carling than before. It's 33% before, now it's 47%. It's gone up quite a bit. The amount of people going for Budweiser has gone down. No one is actually buying the Tesco Valley Lager. It sells zero in this situation, in this test that was run. But it is affecting the preferences of the other one. We like to go for the central option. It's known as extremeness aversion. We prefer the middle options and to avoid the extremes. That's why Starbucks has... Um, Rather than selling small, medium, large, they actually sell medium, large, and extra large. You can ask for a small, it's, on, it's an off-menu item, but by having medium, large, and extra large, you're more likely to order a large than you are a medium. And then they put all the names into different language and none of us are going to play, essentially. Um, so, okay, we're not selling any of Tesco Valley Lager, so we'll take it away, and instead we'll bring to the shelf the Peroni. And... Um, and what's happened now is exactly what you'd expect, which is 90% of people are going for the Budweiser, 10% of people get the Peroni. Now, no one's buying the Carling, but again, another demonstration that we're going for the middle option. Often, 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 people will go for the middle option when we're in any state of uncertainty. So we don't necessarily have a favorite beer or stable preferences. It all depends on the context. And that can often be quite a um, shocking thing to find out. So that's how behavioral science influences beer choice. So you might be thinking, okay, I can see how it works on kind of small, little choices in the supermarket, small things, B to C. But what about really big decisions? Let's go to the biggest one, whether a judge deciding whether he should send someone to their death or not. Um, and I'm going to show you a graph. And I'd like you, somebody to shout out, um, just one, somebody to shout out what they think is, 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 is affecting the shape of the graph. So this on the bottom is uh, time, and on the y-axis, we've got the proportion of favorable decisions. So basically, the higher on the scale, the more likely you are to let the person off, and the lower you are on that scale, the more you are likely to send them to their death. What do we think is affecting that triple decline? Okay, the we. Yes, yes, yes. Somebody said it over there. These lights are very bright. Um, this is food and drink, essentially. So that is breakfast. That's a mid-morning snack. That is lunch. What's happening here is you're more likely to get a favorable decision when the judge has just eaten and drunk. And then, I think it's non-alcoholic. Um, and then it declines throughout the day. So you don't want a trial just before lunch. You don't want a trial just before mid-morning snack. Now, we would think that we're very good at making decisions, high quality decisions, especially on things that are incredibly important, like whether somebody lives or dies. The fact is, our psychology, of, there is a brain-body connection, and your brain is affected by the state of your body. So behavioral science actually happens on some kind of really, really big decisions as well, as well as some of the smaller ones. Um, let's, we're very close to an airport, and I bloody love airports, so, because they're full of psychological interventions, which are just really exciting. Um, here's one done by a professor in uh, Toronto of psychology called Professor Dilip Soman. Um, how do you reduce queues in airports? That's something we all want. Um, well, one way of reducing queues in an airport is whenever you kind of check in or need to get your ticket out to get through a barrier, if you can get people to have their tickets in their hand when they get to that point, you speed up the queue a lot. If you look at kind of queue psychology, you can speed up the queue a lot if people are kind of ready. But in an airport, people tend to be a little bit kind of cautious because they have, um, I know that they don't want to have something pickpocketed or they lose a really important document like the passport or, or the, the boarding card. And so they tend to keep them hidden in backpacks and things so they're hard to reach. So how do you change the behavior? Well, you could, and they did try paying people, multilingual people, to walk up and down the queue saying, please have your 
your tickets and your passes out so we can get the queue going and it's beneficial for everybody. You think you could do that, it makes no difference because everybody follows the normal kind of keeps it in their bag. If you extend that small carpet, you know when you go into the check-in, that, that's going to get on the plane as well. When you go to the check-in, if you extend that small piece of carpet about six or seven feet into the queue, so the first couple of people in the queue are kind of stood comfortably on the carpet, they feel like they're next, they feel psychologically in system, they automatically take their tickets out because they want to prepare for the next thing. So carpet is affecting your and my behavior without us even knowing about it as well. And so you can solve some very, very um, sticky challenges by understanding the psychological context and having a broader way of shaping people's behavior. Carpets can change behaviors. And finally, half of you in the room will know what this is. This is a male urinal. Um, and it's a special urinal. Again, it was at an airport, Amsterdam Airport in Schiphol. And it's important to tell you that because men, when they're in airports, are either drunk, bored, or drunk and bored, which means instead of weighing inside the urinal, sadly, they sometimes will miss. I say they, we will miss sometimes because of those psychological contexts. Um, and you would think that if you could just put up a sign to rationally change their behavior and say, men, if you just concentrate for the 30 seconds while you're going to the bathroom, instead we can afford to spend not the money on cleaners and cleaning products, but we could spend that money on better Wi-Fi or leather seats in the lounge or real rational you know, free beer, whatever it is. You could spend your money on that. It doesn't change behavior because men are kind of drunk, bored or drunk and bored in airports. Instead, what they did on the, on the guide of a psychologist is they etched a small fly into the urinal. And because men have a subconscious desire to aim at all times, and they have an increased um, likelihood of getting it inside the actual uh, receptacle. And it reduces what psychologists call spillage by about 80%, and it solves, pretty much solves the problem. And that's challenging for the human brain to understand, because we tend to think when we want to change big behaviors, we have to have big, expensive, shiny, in-your-face interventions. But sometimes that's because of our proportionality bias. We think that to make a big change in a big intervention, sometimes it can be the small things that make the big difference. You will have all tried things in your jobs where you can make some small tweaks and you get a disproportionate outsize impact. Um, and this is one of those. Um, so why behavioral science? Behavioral science allows us to give names to these things that persuade us so we can better um, try lots of these different things out. We find the persuasion levers that we need to pull inside people's heads to shape their behavior. I want to do with you a quick quiz now. Now, at this point, everybody looks a bit panicked. People go a bit, they stop smiling. Um, it's going to be OK. If everybody has a pen and a paper or an iPad or your phone, it's only going to be for a couple of minutes. You don't have to reveal your answers to everybody else in the room. And it will be totally fine because <laughs> the, the atmosphere has changed in the room. Um, and it's not a quiz based on what has already been said. So it's not a, a retention test or anything. And it's not an intelligence test. It's not designed to say who's the smartest in the room and who's not the smartest in the room. It's merely a, a bit of fun, if you believe it. I think you do. Um, I would recommend covering your answers from your neighbors because I have had a bit of cheating lately since we've gone back into real life. I think everybody's looking honest. Yeah, all good. OK, are we ready? Are we ready? Yes. yes, OK. Which square is darker, the square marked A or the square marked B? Which square is darker, the square marked A or the square marked B? Count how many Fs are in this sentence. That's finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. That's finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. And finally, I'm gonna ask you to try and remember as many of these words as you can. And then I'll say, can we write them down? So please don't write them down straight away, that's cheating. Um, but please try and keep as many of these as you can in your head. Table, legs, wood, sitting, arm, couch, stool, cushion, rocking, seat. 
write down as many as you can. And that's the end of the quiz. So we can all relax now. There's a bit of tension in the room. You can shake it off a little bit if the quiz is over. Uh, please mark your own. Question one, give you a mark if you've got A. Question two, if you've got three. And question three, give yourself a mark if you've got chair. Did anybody get all three correct? Ooh, a couple of people. Anyone get two? Bunch of twos. Ones. Anybody get them? There we go. Did anybody get, anybody get zero right? So if you got zero, you actually got them all correct, because these are the wrong answers. These are the answers that actually, given time conditions, your brain will nudge themselves towards. I'll now take you through the real answers. So which square is darker, the square mark A or the square mark B? They are exactly the same. You might not believe me. If I can, now I have no, we have no PowerPoint skills, really, that could trick you in any way. You can. Ask me for this presentation and I will send you it and you can print these squares out. But look, take away the context. We slowly cover it up and you will see that they are exactly the same shade of gray. Now, your brain should have learned that they are now the exact same shade of gray. And so when we take the context and put it back, you'd think that your brain would go, I know they're the same shade of gray. I'm going to see them the same shade of gray again. But we don't see in the way that we think we see. So, a bit of animation here. Here we go. Boom. They are different. Your brain can't see them as the same anymore. What's happening here psychologically is your brain is overcompensating for the shadow. Very clever at adjusting for light levels. Like, like your digital cameras are. Very, very good at adjusting for that. So, it's seeing the shadow from that big shape. And it's going, anything that I usually see in the dark is actually a bit lighter, so I lighten up. The brain also likes to see patterns, so it's trying to see it as fitting as part of that pattern along the way. We don't see in the way that we think we see. If you don't believe that one, try this one. So we can all agree, I'm sure, that the square on the top is a darker shade of grey, and the one on the bottom is a lighter shade of grey. If you hold out your arm with two fingers like so, and cover up, I think it's a laser on here, that join in the middle, you may start to see that they are the same shade gray. And I always like to take a quick picture of people sticking their fingers up at me during the presentation. So we don't see in the way that we think we see. What did people get for this one? Just a couple of answers. Six, five. Did anybody get four? Four. Which four did you get? The first four, which are, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the third off. So what's happening here is, and people often get this by reading it backwards. It's a great way of, uh, of doing proofreading. Um, but it can be really hard. The better you are at speaking and reading English, the harder it is to find these six Fs. Um, it's often easier for people with English as a second or a third language to find all six if they're not reading backwards. What's happening is of is a V sound. You're actually reading a little bit more with your ears than you think you are. A lot of the things that we understand in our brains come from several senses. Of's a V sound. And so when I ask you to look for F's, of skip straight past. Also, your brain understands grammar. So when you actually read, if you were to put a, an eye scanner on you to read the sentence, it wouldn't be a linear process like this where you take everything in like a karaoke um, ball. And what's actually happening is your eyes dart around all over the place and it kind of looks at the bigger, longer words and pieces it all together. Because you know grammar, you can, that's how you can speed read because you're not actually processing everything left or right. And so you're not actually reading the ofs to understand the sentence. That's another way that, that it works. So we don't see in the way that we think we see. We don't read in the way that we think we read. Did anybody get chair? Chair, couple of chairs, no chairs. So, in a room this large, that's a good number. 
chair is a false memory, it didn't appear on the first list. What's happening here is the brain doesn't remember things like a video recorder, the brain remembers things associatively. So the more creative people in the room tend to, intelligent, attractive, whatever it is, they, they tend to find the word chair um, because they're making connections between the two different words when it goes into their brain. So we don't remember in the way that we think we remember either. So that wasn't an intelligence test. It's simply a way of showing us how false memories work. It shows you how important it is with eyewitness testimony when we're interviewing people um, at the crime scenes to make sure people are really remembering what they think they remember. Chair. Yeah. So the science. We're going to keep this nice and, and quick and simple. Don't worry. Um, but if you go up your uh, spine and where your spine meets the brain at the back, you get to the oldest part of the brain. It's known as system one. It's about the size of your fist. And that's the unconscious part of the brain. On top of that, we as humans have more uniquely evolved uh, system two, which is the conscious part of the brain. That's the part of the brain where we think we think. So we've got the unconscious brain, the automatic brain, system one, and the, and the system two brain is our conscious reflective brain. So if I said uh, five times two, you would say 10. There's still a nervousness from the quiz. <laughs> the answer is 10. Um, and that was, that was an, an automatic, well, that wasn't because everyone was on edge, but the, the, usually that would be an automatic um, uh, piece. It would be fast, uncontrolled, effortless, emotional, a little bit, and unconscious. You know, very quick thing, five times two, just comes to your brain quite quickly. However, if together we did something like um, 17 times 24, that would be a system two calculation. That would be slow, controlled, effortful, deductive, and self-aware. You would have to together, and we won't do it now, too late in the day, um, but we would essentially have to go through some very methodical processes, reflective, but very conscious processes. We probably couldn't do lots of other things while we're doing it. It would take up a lot of our brain, and it'd be a very system to process to do that. Does anybody play a musical instrument? What do you play? Guitar. And how long have you played for? Ten years. Okay, yeah. So ten years is a safe enough time to say that I imagine when you first learned to play, it was quite a system two process, thinking about it quite hard. And then now I imagine a lot of it is in system one where you can do lots of the chords and that type of stuff. And then to allow yourself to sing while you do it if you if you choose. Um, so it frees up other parts of the brain. Every everybody drive? People drive? Yeah, so so when um you never know in London, do you? So so when um when you learn to drive, again, that's a very system two process. It's very slow, controlled, effortful deductive and you're very self-aware when you're doing it. You're kind of thinking about where's the gear stick, paying attention to the people around you, remembering the, 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 the highway code as you go, all that type of thing. And then about three to four months in, if you have regular enough lessons, it becomes quite a system on calculation to the point where some of you would have driven all the way home from work one time perhaps and not even remembered the entire journey. You've been so stressed and something happened at work and your brain is just totally off. Your system one was doing all of the driving, all of the reacting to the traffic lights, dodging all the pedestrians, all that kind of stuff, without your conscious awareness because you're focused on something else. And that's okay. If you were to guess, as a proportion, how many decisions every day are done by your system one brain, that automatic brain, versus your system two brain, would anybody hazard a guess? Although I am going to ask the people that have read Thinking Fast and Slow to sip out of this one. <laughs> Any guesses? 95% on system one. Okay, any higher, any lower? 97 no face in the human race whatsoever. It's kind of, yeah. Maybe some people, yes. Uh, any higher, any lower? 90% to system two. Very good. 70% system one. So it's argued between, it's quite a boring argument, it's argued between a bounds of 90 to 95% of your daily decision making is done as a proportion of system one versus system two. So the majority of our thinking is done with system one. And it's not actually the case that you have some system one decisions and some system two decisions. It's not like you kind of buy chewing gum with system one and buy a mortgage with system two. Every decision that you make is actually a combination of two. So it's when you choose which mortgage you want to go, which imagine, um, yeah, when you, when you buy a house or choose which house you want to go with, 95% of that decision is made through, through your system one brain, your subconscious factors. Did it feel right? Did it smell right? Was the door the right color? That's a factor. 
um, all those types of things, and then 5% would have been rational. It's like when you make, and often people make the spreadsheet, don't they? Because they like to pretend that it's, um, it's a very rational decision. I'm going to have all the factors that I care about. Then we have the options of the housing. You can do this with life partners too. Some people do do that. You have all the factors, all the options, then you score them. And then you realize the one you actually want didn't come out the top. So you kind of change some of the factors and you weight them differently because we like to follow some of our um, instincts along the way. Most of our decision making is done in system one. We only have conscious access to system two. So when we sit around together and we think about how we're going to shape someone's behavior, how we're going to understand why someone did or didn't do something, whether they did, didn't buy, or didn't click, didn't buy, didn't convert, whatever, whatever the, the behaviors we're looking at, we're only going to have a conversation really about system two, the things we think changes people's behavior. But we really need to be having a conversation about the whole brain if we want to be more influential. And to understand the system one brain, we need a map. And that's what I'm going to show you more about um, today. Quick story, just because it's one of my favorite stories. Um, you know when you go into a hotel and you see that little card inside the bathroom that says, it's this hotel. Is anyone staying at a hotel tonight? Okay, you have to look for the sign that says, um, at this hotel, we really care about the environment. Please reuse your towels at least once during your stay. You got that one? I usually collect them because I'm a behavior scientist, but you can, you can leave them in the room. You. Um, when you test those, when you test those out in real hotels, as the ones you're staying in, um, you get about a 10% compliance rate, usually 10 to 12% compliance rate, when you use an environmental plea to get someone to reuse their towels and not just have new towels every single day. If, however, you add what psychologists call social proof to the sign, so it's the idea that we're, we're kind of a herd species, we, we're influenced by what other people are doing around us. If you say um, lots of people who stay at this hotel, or many people who stay at this hotel, um, choose to reuse their towels to support the environment, um, please do it as well. You see a 33% increase, typically, by adding that kind of like seven to 10 word sentence onto the, onto the side. Now, if you ask people, if you do market research and you say, you're staying in a hotel, you got the social proof message, or you got the environmental message, which one's going to work? They tend to say, the social proof message, obviously, I'm not just going to follow the crowd. I've got my own mind. That one's not going to work. But the environmental one definitely is. That's what happens when you put them in the hotel. You see the opposite happens. We don't have introspective access to the part of the brain that's really making decisions. The system one brain is the big, powerful brain that's kind of giving us our instincts and is making a lot of decisions on our behalf. If we're confused as to why something doesn't convert, or why someone isn't clicking, or why someone isn't doing the behavior we want them to do. It's often because we haven't figured out something in the system one brain rather than the system two brain. So I want to show you um, some examples. And this is a, a nice way of thinking about it, which is, it's a bit like, has anyone got one of those DSLR cameras where you've got loads of settings? Now you can go into that, and you can fiddle about and change all the settings manually, and you can adjust them all. But most of the time, unless you're an expert, you tend to just go on auto and it takes a pretty good picture overall. That's how you can think about your brain. We can kind of go very conscious on any decision we want to make and really think about it further. But most of the time, customers or employees or the people around us are simply going around on the auto mode and making kind of the good enough um, decision along the way. So I would encourage you to kind of think about the brain like that. So let's find out about this mystery part of the brain that we've now talked about and, and, and what, what that means. I want to, I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of work that we've done with real people in the real world using these different persuasive um, levers, these different principles of the brain that we can use to hopefully influence their behavior. And I want you to try and guess with me which ones you think would be most effective. I'm then going to give you the answer. There's no trickery in this part of the, the presentation. <laughs> And I want you to feel very proud if you get the answers right. And don't feel bad if, if, you, if you don't quite get, get one. Has everybody heard of the charity Christian Aid? Essentially, it's, um, it's a faith-based charity organization. They make a lot of their donations in Christian Aid week in the summer. And the idea is very kind-looking people like this, volunteers, go around the nation and they drop an envelope into your door at the start of Christian Aid week on the Monday. It's kind of expected, or we, they would like you to put some money in throughout the week, you know, notes, coins, whatever. Um, and then on, at the end of the week, they're going to come around, they're going to collect it, and then we're going to add up how much, and that'll be the success of Christine Avery. The unfortunate thing was, this was pre-pandemic, 
a lot of the donation amounts are going down year after year after year because the kind of the mechanism had, had kind of worn its you know had its time. So we were able with Christine A to redesign the envelope that got given across the UK to hundreds of thousands, millions of households to, to see which would be the most effective way to design the envelope to encourage more people to donate. So many of you would have got these envelopes and, um, and we'll, we'll see the results now. So I'm going to explain there are six. I'm going to explain the psychology behind it. And I want you to just have a little thought inside your head as to whether you think that one was the most effective one or not. So was it the labor illusion? So the labor illusion is the psychological idea that if we show the effort that's gone into something, if we talk about all the labor that's happened to make it happen, people would, would feel more likely to, to give. So on this envelope, um, uh, and this is just like a cut out, a zoom out of the intervention we're talking about here. There was like lots of other information on the page. But we put a big sticker that said, hand delivered by your local volunteer. We dial up that someone has gone to the effort to deliver this. Does that work? Or is it this psychological idea of scarcity? The higher, the less we think there is of something, the higher our desire to have it. Um, so you drive urgency by saying we're only collecting donations this week. Is that the thing that drives the most donations? Or is it cognitive ease, what psychologists call cognitive ease? You basically, we've all got a lot going on in our lives. The brain has to process a lot of information. If we can just sit, give, make it really easy for the brain to understand what this thing is and what to do, is that the thing that's going to drive most, um, most donations? So we literally wrote on the envelope that it was an envelope and um, wrote the word appeal top right to really make it stand out. Or was it the affordance cues, a very small thing, but we changed the envelope from being landscape to being portrait just to see if it made it easier for people to put money in? Or was it salience? This is drawing attention to gift aid. Um, so you know in the UK that the government will match our donations by 25%. You just fill out a couple of details really quickly and you get to give even more without paying anymore. Is that the thing that it gets more people to donate? Is that going to get people going? Or was it what psychologists call costly signaling, which is basically we subconsciously value things more if we can see that a cost has gone in on our behalf. Um, so we like our banks to be made of marble uh, or kind of you know, big stone buildings because it makes it feel like, like a real thing. Um, we made the paper thicker, slightly thicker, from 90 GSM to 150 GSM. I want you to have a little think about which one you think, when tested within the United Kingdom, got more people to donate. And I'd love if we can go around, if you feel comfortable, raise your hand when we go through each one and let's see which one was the winner. Don't put your hands up twice like someone did last week. It's not fair. So just wipe one hand. Labor illusion. And don't look around to see if anyone else put their hand up. Just be proud. If you, here we go, here we go. Uh, scarcity. Bit of scarcity, cognitive ease. Oh, I've got a slip crowd. Affordance cues. On edge with uh, B, salience. Bit of low levels of salience. Costly signaling. Got a basic bit of costly signaling going on as well. So, do we want to see the results? The results are they're in and the control on average had 34 pence put in it. Remember, this is an average on kind of loads of envelopes you get sent out. 34, you know, no one was putting 34 pence, it's an average. Um, on the appeal, 10%. Hand delivered stamp, 13%, for the labor illusion piece. Thicker paper, the costly signaling one, 14% did pretty well. And that beat the increased cost of the paper, in case you're uh, wondering about that. Portrait orientation, a whopping. 17%, simply changing, so well done to those people, simply changing the, or, the, the orientation of the envelope increased donation. We, we are guessing that it feels more secure to put more money in a deeper envelope, perhaps. Um, urgency significantly decreased the amount of money that, um, that people put in. People don't like being rushed. Maybe it's an overused feature within, within the sector, who knows. And salient gift day, giving more money for free reduces the amount and the amount of, amount of money and the amount of people that people, um, so saying, you know, gift aid is, you know, we should, we should speak to the government about this really, um, could be reducing um, donations. So, affordance cues, 17% increase. Just, and that's, that's a hard thing 
to communicate, isn't it? Because often, you know, everybody works, you know, in organizations, large and small. And when we're thinking about how to get a 17% increase in something, the person that puts their hands up and says, I actually think the envelope is the wrong orientation, it's going to get, you know, sent out of the room and, and, um, and, and not given much credibility. However, when you actually run the test, and you're rooted by the psychological principles along the way. When you run the test, you find out that that one, so the surprising science, you might say, is this one, um, of, of knowing uh, which watch to go for. And the best thing about behavioral science is it gives us that map to test counterintuitive solutions that we wouldn't normally come across. It wouldn't normally be the case that we're having that kind of system to um, brainstorm about how to change someone's behavior that we change the, the orientation of the envelope. We're opening up the solution space for things that can be tried by starting with how people really think, feel, and act. Should we do another one? Yeah. I've just realized the clock hasn't started at the back, so I have no idea how long we're going for. So I'm just gonna go until you look forward. Okay, so, so let's see. Um, let's see. Um, KFC, chips, we like those. Um, how do you make an offer more appealing? What is the... Uh, mechanism, the persuasive lead that we can pull that gets more people to um, go for uh, an offer, which was $1 chips. $1 chips was the offer. What are the different ways of framing that psychologically? Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got a clock now. Don't worry, everyone. No, no, we panic. Um, which one? Was it our control that said on chips for $1? Was it reciprocation? So meeting in the middle. So you asked for free chips. So we met you halfway with our chips for $1. So a bit of give, a bit of get. Or was it the value payoff? So you signal the downside. Um, so our chips are $1, but you say pick up only. So, so you kind of, you signal there's something restricted, only for pick up, not for delivery. Is it social norms that we talked about earlier? You know, signaling other satisfaction. So $1 chips, everyone is enjoying our chips for $1. Are you, you talk about the satisfaction of the people. Was it loss aversion? So highlighting the loss, our chips for $1, they won't stick around forever. You have a time sensitive urgency on this. Is that gonna get more people to buy $1 chips? Or is it anchoring a person and you say, this was actually in the terms and conditions that we found this line. Uh, our chips are $1, maximum four per peeps. It was in Australia, that's why it's peeps, not person. Which one do we think it is? I'm gonna take hands for control. No faith in us. <laughs> Simplicity, I guess. Uh, reciprocation. Quite a lot of reciprocation. Value payoff. Social norms. Ooh. Loss aversion. Anchoring. Okay, so we had a winner on social norms. We had a bit on anchoring. The result was anchoring. Talking about the maximum amount of, of chips that people could buy was what actually drove people to buy the most chips. We like ceilings, we like targets, the scarcity drives it along. Some guys in the middle looking very, very happy with themselves that they got that right. I'm very pleased. Um, how do you make a trade-in more effective? Actually, on no, we're good for time. So this is uh, this is in South Africa. This was um, selling a pack of SIM cards together. And essentially, what we have, what we we're trying to do is to get you to kind of bring in your old SIM cards in South Africa in certain areas. They kind of have multiple SIM cards to get the best deals, and they'll kind of swap them around to kind of get get the best deals. We wanted them to kind of uh, buy a new pack, um, which had kind of all the SIM cards all in one, essentially. Um, how do you get people to trade in their old SIM cards for the new SIM card along the way, so they can kind of save a bit of money, and we make we make some money as well? Um, which one won? This was inside their physical retail stores. Do we use defaults and we simply put these items by the checkout in a bin like that? Is that gonna be the most effective way of getting people to do it? Or is it scarcity? So again, driving urgency of low stock, we have a big sign and we say how many in store we have remaining today, kind of stock remaining, really saying, oh, I want that one now. Is it effort reward? We haven't talked about this principle yet, but this is the idea that, um, if you get people to put in effort to do something, they're more likely to kind of believe and want the reward off the back of it. It's like your kind of IKEA furniture, you keep it for longer because you built it and you put the effort to doing it. And in this case, we got people to actually chop up their old SIM cards in stores and then put them into this bucket. So it's extra effort, extra friction, but maybe that kind of gets them to kind of believe into it a bit more. 
Or was it, again, social norms, I know you like those, um, signal probability popularity of the product, and you say, did you know 10 million people have a SIM from PEP? Again, we're going to go around the room. Do we have any arms for defaults? Do we have any arms for scarcity? Bit of scarcity. Effort reward. We have a bit of quite a lot of effort reward around here. And social norms. Boom, boom. Social norms doing well again. We're getting better. It was effort reward, everybody. Um, it had a 122% increase um, versus the average of the other conditions. So actually getting people to put in, you know, often in our world, right, we talk about less effort, more conversion, all that type of stuff. Sometimes it's actually about getting people to put more, more effort into something so they can kind of believe that, that the value is happening. Now we're going to go to a bar together. How do we make a menu more effective? So we've been working with Diageo for years to better understand how do you design menus? What psychological nudges do you put on menus to get people from beer into buying cocktails. And we've got lots of different results, um, some of which are these. Is concreteness, the principle of concreteness, the best way of doing it? So rather than just having the name of the drink, you show the image of the receptacle that the drink will come in. So you know people don't worry that it's going to look too flamboyant. You just kind of have a better idea about what you're buying. Is it concreteness? Is it? Authority bias, so we naturally respond to kind of authority figures within the room. You're more 210% more likely to cross the road at a red light if a man in a suit crosses first rather than a man in a tracksuit. Um, you're more likely to follow your doctor's orders if they have their certificates behind them on the wall, not because they show you them consciously, that you're just subconsciously drinking it in. Um, so it is showing the messenger, you know, the authority bias here of writing kind of and highlighting credible awards like the Gold Award winner next to the drink, does that get more people to buy cocktails rather than beer? Or is it social norms again? Here we go. Um, signaling its popularity, so the world's favorite, Johnny Walker, Red, and, uh, Red Label and Ginger, the world's favorite. Or is it the messenger effect? So we know that we often focus a lot on what the message is rather than who is communicating the message. We know that who is communicating the message has a massive psychological advantage if we get it right. So it is saying bartender's choice for this drink can make more people buy the drink. Or chunking, the simple action of in a sea of stuff on a page, putting a box behind the one you want people to buy. Is it as simple as putting a box behind the one you want people to buy? Or was it what we're calling here nudge mixology, which is a bit of a combination of loads of them. Does that make it less likely? Do they cancel each other out or do they have a multiplicative effect? So here we've got bartender's choice. You've got the image of the drink as well. We've got multiple nudges in there. So I can see the rampant debate around the room on which ones it is, um, but you still need to make an individual choice. Else, you know, we're not playing as tables um, and there's no prizes. So uh, let's have a confident hand for concreteness. No, really. Yeah, what we, yeah. Okay. Authority bias. Bit of authority bias. Social norms. Oh, we've got a. People are waiting for one of the bottom three now. A messenger effect. Chunking. <laughs> um, or nudge mixology. A couple, but we basically think chunking, I think, for the room. It was nudge mixology actually had. So the chunking did have a significant effect. I think it was around 18% actually. So it was significant for the size of the intervention that it is. But actually in this case, the right combination of nudges do have a multiplicative effect. The wrong combination of nudges can cancel each other out a bit. So it's about making sure you have the right one, like, like cooking, you have the right nudges for the right, for the, for the right intervention. And, okay, so we've heard a lot from, from uh, these different tests that can be run. So we're testing, you know, whether it's an online environment, a digital environment, and we're testing out different ways to understand how to persuade someone. I want to take a step back now and really think about how do we really shape people's behavior um, in a more holistic way. And rather than just doing all this testing all the time, how do we design from the ground up great products and services to get people to do great things in the world? So I'm going to show you a quick video about how do we help people monitor their children's health.
the Ecuadorian Andes, more than 300,000 children are battling chronic malnutrition. As they live in isolation, it is extremely difficult to establish periodical medical visits, and sometimes there is even a cultural gap and distrust with modern medicine. Most of these health problems go unnoticed by their parents, leading to incurable diseases or even death. Aquí en vez de haber crecimiento hay decrecimiento. Entonces las mamitas piensan que porque están gorditos los niños están sanos y no es así. The correct way to evaluate a child's physical development is through their height, not their weight. Mother Blanket Inspired by one of the deepest cultural connections these moms have with their babies, the Sikinji, we turned their iconic blankets into a pediatric evaluation system. Alongside female weavers, we designed different patterns that explain in their native dialect the appropriate size for children during the first two years of development, according to the World Health Organization. Blankets were distributed to mothers in the community centers where they were trained on how to monitor physical health so they could be able to continuously track their baby's growth no matter how far they are and travel to a medical center if something is out of the safe numbers. Para las Naciones Unidas, luchar contra la malnutrición es una prioridad. Y utilizar una costumbre propia para hacerlo es una gran idea. Today, Andean mothers correctly track their babies through this natural, it has been a centuries old tradition. I just love that example of going with the flow of what people are already doing. Those kind of events are wholly service. Medical things don't need to look medical. We literally give people the, a redesigned version of a thing that they are already having as part of their daily lives so you can nudge people's behavior that way. I think it's just such an elegant solution on an important topic. Similarly, how do we get people to wash their hands? So we've all had a crash course in hand washing over the past couple of years. We're all getting pretty good at it now. If we're all honest, we're kind of falling back a bit, aren't we, since kind of March 2020. Um, but ultimately, um, washing hands can. Um, save lives and it can cause um, death as well, especially when we're working in food processing environments. So this again was a pre-pandemic work with Kimberly Clark, looking at some of their partners who they sell their hand washing solutions to. Um, again, they have this great product and it sells very well, but the magic really is making sure that it actually gets used correctly and that we can create these hand washing habits so that when people go into a food processing plant, they wash their hands correctly. And when they leave the food processing plant, again, they wash their hands again in order to remain compliant. If they're not compliant, that factory has huge costs. They have to close the factory for a bunch of days whilst they um, steam clean everything back down. They have to pay a fine to the brands of which they've affected, having to do a massive kind of global product recall, and it affects the reputation. Also, if they're found by the, the, the local governments to not have the right uh, levels of hand washing compliance, again, it basically becomes a billion dollar problem when you add it up across lots of areas, simply because we, need, we can't get people to wash their hands correctly when they're going into a food processing environment and when, and when they're leaving it. So, for over a decade, they tried many different solutions. They tried paying you more if you did wash your hands, they tried paying you less if you didn't wash your hands, they tried group solutions, they tried individual solutions, and none of which were having the impact that we would like people to have. So we went into the environment, we audited it psychologically to look for those different features along the way that we could use to shape people's behavior. And we essentially invented a stamp. And it was a stamp with a specially designed sticky ink, which basically was stamped onto your hand, and it takes the same amount of time to wash that stamp off your hand as the legal amount of time that you have to wash your hands for. You then can't leave the environment without having to wash your hands because you still have the stamp visible. We're using this kind of social signaling um, to really make sure that we turn the problem of bad hand hygiene but kind of invisible to visible, essentially. And you can see people getting their hands stamped from there. When you do that, we get an instant 63% reduction in dirty hands simply with the power of a hand stamp. And again, it's one of those things where it's hard to sit in a big boardroom at the beginning and say the solution to this massive billion dollar problem is a hand stamp. 
but sometimes it can be those outsized impacts that we get from those very precisely found um, places to, to intervene. And how do you get kids to wash their hands before eating? This is one of the most ingenious ideas uh, I've seen, um, so I hope you enjoy it. Kids love to use their hands. Kids explore the world with their hands. In India, they use their hands for one more thing, eating food. Not washing their hands with soap is one of the main causes for illnesses and dropouts. So we gave shape to a simple idea. We infuse chalk sticks with soap. Introducing Savlon Healthy Hands Chopsticks. These work just like regular chopsticks. But at lunch break, they did more than just writing. The chalk powder turned into soap on its own. Through such initiatives, Sablon West India is reaching out to schools across the country. Kids' health will now be in good hands, their own. Behavior can just change the things that they already have along the way. Um, really quickly, we've got no time left, so I'm going to skip this one. It's such a shame, it's such a great one. Um, but um, I want to show you if you're interested in behavioral science, um, you can find out more. Um, I know some of you have been reading already, which is great. Um, we host the world's largest festival of behavioral science known as Nudge Stock, um, and um, we had our 10th one last year, and we have the world's um, most exciting academic talking about some really interesting. And um, bits and all of it's on YouTube as well. My YouTube channel is on Ogilvy Consulting UK that you can go back and you can watch. And um, we also um, have Nudge Talk, which is our podcast and article series. So we've written about lots of really interesting, relevant topics that you can go on and, and read about. And also we have um, Nudge Talk um, and Nudge Talk Asia, which talks about lots of different behavior change work happening around the world with psychology at the heart of it. And we also commit to publishing the case studies that we can every year as well, which wins all the awards, and um, you can basically read about some of the cases you've seen today and more, um, should, should you like to, and we're going to keep doing that every single year. And if you're into books, I said I'd give you some book recommendations. These are the books that have been written by and articles written by people on our team. Uh, you, you can more than welcome to email me. I can, I can send you this, this, uh, this slide. But Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense by Rory Sutherland, well worth uh, a Google, um, Rory Sutherland. Uh, uh, for, for his TED talks along the way, and you see a whole whole raft of them. That I, if I had more time, I would. I would. I've had plenty of time. If I would tell you more more about along the way, and um, it's been an absolute pleasure. If you do want to continue speaking to me, I made a QR code where you can basically get um, uh, sort of the contact details, and um, we can continue the conversation um, there. I hope you enjoy scanning that, and it's been an absolute pleasure. It's a long time to pay attention. I hope you had a good time. I hope you've learned that. Uh, we don't think in the way that we think we think. We don't read in the way we think we read. Well, our brains are totally um, uh, wired in a way that we don't have access to our thoughts. And so if we want to change people's behavior, if we want to shape people's behavior, we need a map to understand that system one brain 
in order to, to really find more and interesting ways to shape behavior. And we should do lots of testing, and especially in digital environments. That's how we're going to get to even more conversion along the way. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.